Should you have your ovaries removed if you've been diagnosed with breast cancer? In this video, I'm going to be talking about ovarian suppression and ovarian removal after breast cancer. Before I go any further, I wanna invite you to subscribe to our channel. And I also wanna make this key note that this video is for people whose tumors are estrogen and or progesterone receptor positive. If you had, for example, a triple negative breast cancer, or if you had a breast cancer that was ER and PR negative, but HER2 positive, this video isn't for you. The one exception would be people who have a BRCA or other mutation that increases their risk for ovarian cancer. So this video is for you if your tumor was or is estrogen and or progesterone receptor positive. So why would we suppress or remove the ovaries? Ovarian suppression or removal is a way to lower estrogen in your body. The main source of estrogen when you're premenopausal, when you have functioning ovaries, is your ovaries. After menopause, after removal of the ovaries and somebody without functioning ovaries, the main source of estrogen is elsewhere in the body. But today, in this video, I'm focusing on the ovaries as a source of estrogen. If you've watched our other videos, and if you haven't, I would encourage you to do so, you'll know that tumors that are hormone receptor positive respond to treatments, whether it's to shrink the tumor or after the treatment is over, or in people with advanced breast cancer, where cancer is in other parts of the body, that lowering estrogen's ability to get to the tumor is a key part of treatment in people whose tumors are hormone receptor positive, as I started this very long sentence with. So this is an adjunct treatment, or can be the primary treatment in somebody who hasn't yet had treatment for breast cancer. And in people with disease, early stage disease can increase the likelihood of cure. In people with advanced disease, suppressing or removing the ovaries can lead to a remission, either complete or partial remission. This is really the mainstay of treatment in people who are premenopausal, have functioning ovaries, who have advanced or metastatic disease. Now, they don't always have to be removed. Those ovaries can also be suppressed with injection. So let me turn now to how we do this. How do we do ovarian suppression or removal? The most common way we start, at least, is with suppression of the ovaries through an injection of a type of drug called an LHRH analog. And we'll spell that out here on the screen. So these injections make your body basically go into what's called a medical menopause. Basically your ovaries go to sleep. This can take a while, it can take a few months. If you're young, really young, like early 30s or mid 30s, it can take maybe several months for this to happen. If you're closer to natural menopause, then this will happen in maybe a shorter amount of time. But in general, three months is the expected time with some people a little sooner and some people a little bit longer. These injections are reversible. So when you come off the medication, the ovaries will wake up again and go back to making estrogen. And this is important for people who want to build a family. And I'll get to that more in just a moment. Another way to remove the ovaries or suppress the ovaries is through surgical removal of the ovaries. This is a pretty low risk procedure, but not zero risk procedure. So the ovaries are usually removed through a laparoscopic procedure where two small incisions are made and the ovaries are removed with small instruments. So it's not a big open incision in your body. And this can be done at any point. It can be done as the first way the ovaries are suppressed, or it can be done after you've already been on the injections for a while and you know that you tolerate them. One reason to start with the injections is so that you go into menopause a little more slowly instead of instantly. If you have your ovaries removed, you're gonna go through menopause in about 
five minutes, which is really challenging. So a lot of people choose to be on the injections, see how they do, and then have the ovaries removed. If you're going to build a family, you may also want to have the suppression, wake the ovaries back up by stopping the injections, and then later on, after you've had your family, then have the ovaries removed. The fallopian tubes are usually removed as well, and the uterus is not. The uterus, having the uterus removed, because the uterus doesn't make estrogen, does not offer any advantage to you. There are some reasons to consider it if, for example, you have a, an inherited susceptibility to endometrial cancer, but that's not the majority of you watching today, though it's an important minority. The other way, the final way that ovaries can be sort of put to sleep is through radiation therapy. This is a non-invasive way to have the ovaries put to sleep. Basically, if you have this done, you lie on your back that allows your, you're on your back and then you're tilted down a little so that all your intestines move away from the radiation field. And then the ovaries are radiated. This isn't used very much in the United States, but it is an option. It may not be discussed very often, but it is an option. And it's nice because it's non-invasive and in general permanent, which is helpful if you are done having a family and you want to be sure that the ovaries don't wake up again. So does every premenopausal person, person with functioning ovaries, need to have this done? Absolutely not. In people with ductal carcinoma in situ or very low risk disease, it's not recommended. It's recommended in people who have had chemotherapy or in people who would have had chemotherapy but either had a medical reason not to or who said, I don't want chemotherapy, I'm not going to have it. So the way this is described is in, as people who are candidates for chemotherapy, whether they get chemotherapy or not. The other thing is if you are going to get chemotherapy and you're close to when your ovaries would have naturally shut down on their own, let's say you're in your late 40s or early 50s, you may not need to have this done. It's possible that the chemotherapy will put you into another form of medical menopause, a joy, right? To have hot flashes and be going through menopause, even if it's just temporary when you're going through chemotherapy. I know it's not fun, but it does mean you would not need to have suppression or removal or radiation of the ovaries. So to summarize again, people who had functioning ovaries or have functioning ovaries, who had high enough risk disease that chemotherapy was offered, whether or not it was received, whose tumors again are estrogen or progesterone receptor positive, and who are not at the natural point of their own menopause. So that's in whom this is recommended. Turns out fewer people are having this done than probably should be. This is an underused treatment. If you're watching this video wondering, why wasn't this recommended? Uh, it may be because your doctor is afraid to bring it up or they think the chemotherapy is sufficient or it's not clear whether your ovaries are still functioning or not. A blood test can be done to see if your ovaries are functioning and if after chemotherapy it looks like they're not. This can be repeated because those ovaries can wake up again after chemotherapy. That's important to know. If you are interested in knowing whether ovarian suppression or removal is right for your specific case, I invite you to go to yerba.com to get your personalized yerba report. Your Yerba report takes all the information and medical records that you've either uploaded to us or have given us permission to access, creates a report of everything we know about what you've already had in terms of treatment, everything we know about your cancer to this point, and then shows you the different treatment options that might be offered to you and the pros and cons. And it also shows you a list of questions that would be 100% reasonable to ask of your medical team. If you get the premium edition, you can ask Yerba. That is, you can submit questions to Yerba and those will be answered specifically by people who've looked at your individual medical records. While not a second opinion and not providing treatment recommendations, your Yerba report and the Ask Yerba options are another form of information support that can aid you along your treatment journey. So what about fertility and the impact of ovarian suppression on fertility? So when the ovarian suppression is stopped, 
periods come back, people can then have a pregnancy, depending on how old you are and what you, you know, your ovarian reserve, tests for which can be done by oncofertility specialists. So it's possible to have a normal, healthy pregnancy after ovarian suppression has ended. You might want to check out our video on fertility and also our videos on pregnancy after breast cancer. So we have some resources that go into more detail. If you have your ovaries removed, you won't get pregnant after that. So if you are not done with growing your family, building your family, do not have your ovaries removed. It's not actually possible to become pregnant. Now you could carry a pregnancy if you have an intact uterus with endocrine support. I'm not going to go into that, but it is possible for people without ovaries to have a pregnancy. Now I'm talking data and survival and studies show this and your doctor will offer. It's really important to know, and I hope you're still watching this video, that going through menopause, whether it's medical or surgery, surgical menopause is not a walk in the park. There are quality of life and other health issues like your bone health and heart health, your cholesterol, sexual health. There are a whole host of other things that matter and we know that they matter. The purpose of this video was to talk about the medical indications for suppression or removal of the ovaries. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.